Hey guys, and welcome back to The Ledger Show. We're excited to be back with you to continue our series on the Beatitudes. Today we're going to be looking at verse 5, which is going to be the third verse in the Beatitudes as we break down Matthew chapter 5. And really looking forward to this lesson. We have our guest with us again, Brother Seth Levins. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for the invite. Glad to be here. Oh, we'd like to give a shout out and a thanks to Brother and Sister Kenzie for encouraging us and believing in what we're doing and allowing us to have a space uh, in their facility to do this. Without that, it wouldn't be possible. Um, and if you haven't tried the Holy Grounds coffee shop, get over there. They even have some low-carb versions of their <laughs> coffee beverages, and they're pretty good. Um Move the mission. If you're not donating to missions, go to Holy Grounds and buy a coffee and you're donating to missions because all the proceeds go to missions. Um, Yeah, that's it. We're going to go and open with prayer like we normally do and get into this. Sam? Lord, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace. We thank you for your sound mind, God. We give you all glory and honor in this place, Lord. We ask that you would open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive your word, O God. Let us be good ground, Father. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, as we've said, we're going to start off in verse 5. Again, this is Matthew chapter 5, as we are talking about the Beatitudes that Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. First, let's read the verse. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, I've been really excited to talk about this one. I had my understanding of this passage challenged within this last year um, from a secular source, as a matter of fact. But uh, I'm going to present the idea without getting into too much of the weeds of what this individual was talking about. Um, My focus is going to be on the meek uh, because I think that my understanding was really off on what this meant. Okay. This is what... The individual presented meekness to mean. And when I took it away, I'm going to bring some scriptures to try and and validate what I believe to be true because I struggled with this concept for a while. It really challenged what I thought. Meekness, we're thinking about it all wrong. Meekness does not mean weak. Correct. It does not mean weak um, because there's no... There's no virtue in weakness. So that's the idea, right? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. There's no virtue in that. And the the statement that was made was, a rabbit is not virtuous. It is just prey. (laughs) It can't defend itself. And if something bigger and badder, or a hawk even, wants to eat that thing, guess what? (laughs) We're having rabbit stew. It's Mm -hmm. done. I I mean, reality is... There's no virtue in its ability to defend itself or for self-preservation. It's not choosing higher ground in any of its behavior. It just simply exists in a weak and frail state. Meekness was described this way by the individual. Those that possess swords know how to use them and choose to keep them sheathed. Now this really pushed me outside of a comfort zone with meekness and I really struggled with this thought for a while. I really kind of went back and forth with this and I finally did what I should have done to begin with as I turned to scripture though with this idea in mind. Now I know normally I go into scripture all preconceived notions, assuming that whatever I find in the Word is going to prove me wrong so that I can try and grow beyond my own ignorant self, right? Well, this time I went just to see, is there any truth to what this individual is speaking? And I found something that I had never really noticed before. I'm going to present it to the group, and I'm going to pose a question. The question is, Jesus is hanging out with the disciples. And at some point, he asks them, 
Do you have a sword? No, we don't. He says, okay, take this purse, sell it, take your garments, sell them, and buy one. All right. So the disciples, you know, I don't know how quickly they went or whatever, but we know that they left and they went and purchased a sword. Now, how do we know this? Because Scripture actually reveals to us that they return to Jesus and say, hey, this is all we found, and he said, it's enough. However, beyond that, we see that Peter is in possession of a sword when they are in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is praying. Because what happens? The high priests come, well, the high priest servants come, rather, and they come to apprehend Jesus out of his place of prayer, and what happens is that Peter pulls the sword out, and we've heard all kinds of preaching on this, cuts off the servant of the high priest, servant. Jesus stoops down, picks up the ear, just puts it right back on the servant, and restores the thing that Peter had done. And he turns to Peter, and in, in a what I would call a rebuke, says those that live by the sword will die by the sword. And he commands Peter to sheathe that thing. Now, when I read Scripture, I'm going to read two verses, and please go read this story. It's in the Gospels, but I'm going to focus on Luke because we see it chronologically here. Luke 22, 36. Then he said unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Jesus tells them, You're not armed, arm yourself. Okay? And then in 22 and 50, and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. We know for a fact the disciples were not in possession of swords. Jesus tells them to get one. But then when they use the sword for its intended purpose, he rebukes them. The question is why? Why? Why does Jesus call them to arm themselves and then rebuke them for utilizing the tool that he just told them to go and get? Right. Now, when I really meditated on this and chewed this fat for a long time, I was reminded of the scripture where Jesus tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Serpents know how to inflict pain. They do know how to mortally wound. And yet, even though they possess the knowledge of how to, they are called to be harmless as doves. We are called to be harmless as doves. Wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. And suddenly what I realized is that the self-control that was required to keep that sword sheathed, knowing full well how to use it and what it's intended for, is what Jesus, I believe, was after. Because if he wasn't calling them to violence, what reason was there to have the sword? Jesus is interested in us controlling our emotions, not being controlled by them. And in that moment, Peter was overwhelmed with passion and anger or whatever other sentiment he was feeling yep. that he felt the need to draw a weapon on the servant of the high priest. And Jesus told him that was the wrong thing. Yep. I see all of this in Scripture and then I take it back and I reconsider what this person in the secular world said. Those that possess swords know how to use them and choose to keep them sheathed. This is their definition of meekness. And scripturally, I'm not saying it's a flawless argument, but I am saying that there's a lot of scripture that seems to back it up when you start digging. There is a self-control yeah. that someone is being called to. And what I love is that meek in this passage, the Greek word translates to mildness of disposition, humble. Yep. Mm -hmm. So already the pattern that developed when we see the poor in spirit, they are, it is the action of making oneself low to humble mm -hmm. oneself. We see that in action. We see it again for when we're called to mourn as, as we had an opportunity to discuss. And if you haven't seen those episodes, please go back and watch them in order because what you'll find is that 
Jesus wasn't randomly pulling bullet points. He was building something yeah. right. because mm -hmm. all of this ties into each other. And so go back and watch those episodes and hear what the Word of God has to say. But we see this calling to be in control. Not that you are to have control. Right. Not mm -hmm. that you are to have all authority because that's the beauty of it. It's not about having control over Matt or Sam or Brother Seth. It's about being in control of Mike. I have to be in control of me. I have to keep myself in check would be another way that we would say this. And it really challenged my understanding of what meekness really was. Mm. Because that's an individual that is capable of so much more. But they're keeping it in check. Yeah. One definition I found which goes wrong with that, it says gentleness or meekness is the opposite of self-assertiveness and self-interest, <laughs> which goes right with that. You know, we this culture preach, you need to be assertive, you need to stand up, blah, blah, blah. And God says, no, you need to learn to trust in me. You mm. need to learn that I am the one who has control of the situation. Keep your sword where it needs to be because... You you can't really win this on your own. Right. It's by controlling your own emotions. Right. right. And trust in God. Um, someone said this in the Old Testament: the meek are those wholly relying on God, rather than their own strength to defend against injustice. Wow. So I think meekness is understanding. It, it's not about promoting yourself. It's not about defending yourself even yeah. it's about letting god yeah do all of that yeah that's awesome and it, mm. with, uh, along with the the mildness of disposition and <clears throat> this is probably a rephraseology of what you just said but gentleness of spirit mm -hmm. um in, in the in the greek as well and, and that kind of points all the way back to our first episode in the series right as far as um the spirit, right? Being poor in spirit, mm -hmm. right? And, and what all that meant was then flowing back to the mourning process and now we're going into meekness, which I think actually you touched on last week a little bit when you were talking about being teachable. Um, it, it's impossible in my estimation and in my experience, um, there has to be meekness in someone for them to be teachable they have to be willing to humble themselves to the knowledge and understanding of another. And that's what that means, right? Is mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, or humility, humble, right? And we get into that. And the idea of meekness, it should be transformed. And I don't, I don't know that anybody culturally understands, at least in this culture now, what it truly means to be meek. Because the, the only thing they think is is weakness. And it's like, you can't... I'm trained in how to use my sword. I don't want to use it. Don't make me use it. Mm -hmm. It's the self-governance, mm -hmm. right? It's the idea that the Spirit of God should be bridling my tongue, mm -hmm. should be bridling my abilities, should be bridling everything I do. The Spirit of God should be everything that bridles every aspect of, of me, uh, other than the carnality, that should just be crucified on the cross in our prayer life. But the idea of meekness, I think, goes hand in hand with that teachability that we talked about last episode um, in mourning process, right? Because in the mourning process, um, we have to admit that we don't have the answer. Right. And we have to be able to be teachable and in that moment, humble ourselves and go, okay, what is the process? How do I get out of the pain and into the future? Right? And it's really cool when you start looking at uh, the inheritance process. <clears throat> because, I mean, obviously, you've got your right off the cuff to receive a lot. <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, the, the first Greek definition is to receive a lot especially a part of an inheritance receive as an inheritance obtained by right of inheritance to be an heir or to inherit 
Now here's here's the really cool part, right? As we we move on, we move through this, and, and there's a root to this. That is one who receives a lot by an heir, right? Um, but in the messianic usage, which I, I firmly believe this is what this is talking about, is one who receives his allotted possession by right of sonship. The inheritance that Christ is always talking about has nothing. I, I mean. He shall inherit the earth, but he's not going to inherit it so that he can rule over it as a son of man. We inherit the earth so that we can rule over it as a son of God. And that, that's forthcoming out of the fact that I think in uh, James, maybe. Uh, I'm probably wrong. I'm sorry for, for that. Anyways, uh, the earth groans for the manifestation of the sons of God. Why? Because the sons of man rule the earth in a way that kills the earth. It's self-governing. It's, it's self-propaganda. It's only good for me. It's only There is no meekness. There is no temperance. There is no goodness in it. But the sons of God should, should rule in a way that goes, this is my inheritance. This earth and the entire cosmos, for that matter, is my inheritance. And we rule it with justice and peace and rest and, and goodness and meekness. Why? Because I don't want to have to cast judgment, but I will. I don't want to have to do this, but I can. And that's the key is the capability, right? So we have to possess the ability, but it does not mean that because we possess the ability that we should be acting on it. Uh, okay, so it's the same idea that um, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. It, it may, be, it may yeah. be possible, it may be lawful for yeah. you to do, but it yeah. may not be in your best interest to do this. Mm -hmm. Here's another way we can think of this. I'm not going to advocate for violence. What I will say, the guy that is most effective in a fight, the man that knows what he's doing in a fight, is the last one that wants the fight. Yeah. It's the same way that you can have a gun guy that is all gung ho about his 2A rights and going to defend he and his, but a soldier who's been to war almost dreads picking up his weapon because he knows what it really, he understands the weight or the implications yeah. behind it. Okay, so just so I'm not just quoting things all over the place. Matthew 10, 16, Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. For anyone who's listening that wants to find it in the Word. Proverbs 21, 31, not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well. The writer of Proverbs says, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. You have your sword. You know how to use it. You are prepared in the day of battle. But safety comes from the Lord. And it's, it's that understanding that you're going to rely solely, the meek rely solely on God right. for protection, for provision, for the victory. They're not dependent on their own ability, even though they possess the ability. And that's the piece that was getting me, Sam, is that you're called to inherit the earth. If you inherit land, to, to be an owner of land, just that idea alone. What is the point? What is the point to be a ruler of the land? And that's the piece that really got me. It is this idea of this passing of authority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is the passing of authority. Am I going to pass the authority to the young man who's got a temper and he's ready to throw fists mm -hmm. with anyone that looks at him sideways? Or am I going to pass my authority to the individual that can hold his own in a fight and he's going to do everything he can to avoid one? It's like Moses. Um, Numbers 12 and 3 tells us Moses was like the meekest man yeah. outside of Christ. It was Moses. And when you look at Moses, multiple times God said, I want to kill all of them. Yeah. Multiple times. And Moses, every <laughs> single time, for the most part, <clears throat> Lord, don't wipe me out before you take them out. I mean, God said, I will raise up a, a, a nation through you 
and no, you can be the father of this great nation. And Moses says, no, it's not about me. These are your people. Yeah. Uh, so when Aaron, uh, Aaron right. and Miriam came, and you know they're all they're doing, and Moses he he intercedes for them. Right. Um, and then you talked about sharing authority. Um, I believe it was one of the evidence uh, when they're calling the seventy elders, and God's gonna put part of Moses' spirit right on those elders, and I believe two of them did not come. So they did not come, and they start prophesying in the camp. And so Joshua, um, trying to defend Moses, right? He says, Moses, uh, tell them to stop. Don't let them prophesy. They they did not come. And Moses, he's like, I wish everyone would operate in this same type of authority. So meekness, I mean, Moses is a great example. Um, it's not defending yourself, and it's wishing that, you know what, God, don't just further the kingdom through me. Right. But God further the kingdom through each and every one of us. Sure. Right. It's not just about me. It's about all of us. And you read Moses, and that's a perfect story and example of truly being me. Because he had, he was the leader. I mean, part of the Red Sea, did right. all the plagues. If he really wanted to, he had that sword that he could have used on his sure. people. Right. And he never did. He Cons- always mourned for him. Right. And consider, though, consider that Moses was raised as a prince in mm-hmm. Egypt. Right, and I'm not referring to the movie from DreamWorks, although it's a pretty cool cartoon movie of Moses. But with that being said, though, he was raised in an empire, a world power, so that he had the faculties necessary to lead a nation and to take land. He saw that exercise in Pharaoh. He saw it lived out. He lived in Pharaoh's house, so he was trained. And, and possessed the ability, but yet he was meek and temperate in mm-hmm. his spirit. That is the kind of leader that God looks to and says, I want you to lead yeah. my people. Mm-hmm. I don't want someone that's got a, a temper yeah. that's going to fly off the handle that is unstable because he's ruled by his emotions. I want someone that even though he possesses all of this, even though he's wise as a serpent, mm-hmm. he's harmless as a dove, that's who I can be. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. a person that I can use because they're teachable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I think this is this is kind of driven home later on in chapter five of Matthew, right? In in verse uh, forty three, we'll start. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. I mean, we're we're taught that from a young age, you know. Oh, that's my enemy. You should, you know, you got to hate them. Or on a socio political arena, you know, the left hates the right, the right hates the left, uh, this country hates that country. We're taught that, but I say unto you. Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Mm. Undertone here, because when we're the father of, when we're the children of our Father that's on earth, oftentimes we can operate solely in our Father's hatred. Right. You know, fathers teach their sons. Da, da, they teach their children how to hate. Mm-hmm. Hatred of an ethnicity, hatred of a country, hatred of anything is always taught. It's never inherently in a child. Mm-hmm. Right. And so when we become the children of our Father that is in heaven, we begin to operate differently because we operate in, in that meekness, in that ability to go, I know how to judge you right now. I know how to absolutely destroy Everything that you hold dear, but I'm not going to because it's not that time yet. Because my Father in Heaven has said, it's time for love. It's time for peace. It's time for restitution. It's time for reconciliation. And it goes on to say, for He maketh His Son his son, to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Why? So that the meek might be made known. So that the people that can't. For He... For if he loved them that love you, what reward have you? Uh, it, it does no good to only love the people that love you. Look at I think the I think the perfect example of this right now in our culture is uh, influencers. Right? <laughs> influencers. Oh my gosh! Just look at me. I'm just, I'm just 
and, and they love their followers and their followers uh, until something happens and, oh, canceled. And then it's hate, it's anger, it's rage. There is no, there is no true love in that. There's no meekness in that. But becoming a child of our Father in heaven teaches us, it shows us that right here that meekness is the only way for us to truly reveal the love of God. The love of our Father is revealed by us going, by being humble in those moments when we, when we probably know more, probably know how to do better, but go, yeah, can you show me how to do that? Can you, sh yeah, that's fine. And being teachable, being able to receive instruction, and then pivoting that into the ability to go, hey, let me teach you something now. Let me show you something now. And because of that meekness, because of that gentle spirit, that person is much more willing to receive from you because you're not the status quo. Well, it sets you apart. And I know it's been said, but I just have to say it again because of the verse you just read. Again, we see this building on itself. We reference the fact that it rains on the just and the unjust. So here's what we see. He maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. The sun rising is the darkness fleeing and light being shown forth. So the sun rising on the evil and the good is the good thing happening to both good and evil. Yep. The rain... Rain can be a good thing, but rain at the wrong time it can ruin a harvest, it can ruin a crop. Uh, in this context, Christ is saying that the good and the bad happens to the good and the bad. And we talked about that with money, is that yeah. it can come to you. Yeah. And again, we see this tie-in with yeah. meekness, is yeah. that this Christ is building this thing yeah. in his sermon yeah. that he's teaching us if we will remain teachable. Yeah. Um, but it is an incredible thing that he's calling us to. And how difficult is it, though? So we can define this thing, but how easy is it to live this? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, that's, that's, that's the struggle, right? <clears throat> is the fact that I, I, think, I think the hardest part about living this part is, for he maketh his son. It's not just the world's goodness, but it's literally the blessings of God like, I'm going to give them to everyone. I'm going to give my penny to whoever will. I'm going to offer it to everyone. Right? And, and the hardest thing for Christians to do is look at someone who's in the world who doesn't have any issues denying Christ. Hmm. It's, that's, that's the hardest struggle, right? Like, well, God's been so good. No, I did all this. And you're just like, but you didn't. Mm -hmm. But they don't, they don't understand meekness. They don't understand that the difference is that when his son comes, I know that when the rain comes, I'm going to see the sun again. Well, yeah, and they, they lean on themselves. There's this uh, almost celebration of self. Yeah. Um, that I have accomplished all of this. Yeah. But this is a very old thing that God addressed even in Deuteronomy. We've actually touched on this before, but it's relevant here. Uh, Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. God was speaking this in response to a people that say in their heart, My power and the might of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. In other words, my hard work and dedication has got me where I am today. Yeah. And the Lord was saying in Deuteronomy, who gave you the power to do everything that you've done yeah. to get you where you're at? Yeah. Mm. There's mm. only one source. I think a perfect example culturally right now, I don't know if you guys have heard it, but uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson has got a new song out. <laughs> I didn't even know he did songs. Yeah, well, apparently this is, uh, well, it's it's wild because, you know, reading that scripture, uh, I think the chorus is, uh, I put in the work, I put in the hours. Uh, I did something, what's my name? 
taking full credit of it's my name that created this. Mm -hmm. It's my name that has done. It's me who has done this. And there is no meekness in that. No. Most people can't live in meekness because they feel like they will be taken advantage of. But the true meek, they're not taken advantage of. Go ahead. You want to steal? Steal. You want to take? Take. I'm telling you right now, it's wrong. Don't do it. That's not being taken advantage of. That's giving a, that, that's, I don't know, one of the most impactful things you can do for someone's, for someone's salvation is be meek towards them. Allow them the, the space to do what they want to do while admonishing them using the spirit, the gentleness of the spirit of Christ, saying, hey, this is probably not the right thing you should do. Because according to scripture, boom, and, and this and that. Go ahead. Uh, I, it didn't, I didn't need to jump in here. I just saw something. We read earlier that meekness was a mildness of disposition. I just wanted to see what the secular definition of disposition was, right? Uh, it's a person's inherent qualities of mind and character. Listen to this one. The way in which something is placed or arranged, especially in relation to other things. Simply put, putting it in its proper place. Yeah. Hmm. Putting God in his proper yeah. place and putting okay. self in its you. proper place. So, I guess that's what I've been waiting for. Proverbs 3 and 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. <clears throat> that's how you can maintain it. Right. That's the only way to maintain it. Right. It's not possible any other way because it's going to go against what you and your will and your nature, your inherent nature wants to do. Right. Like uh, Brother Seth said, being teachable, that part is something that is learned. You you go through enough experiences, like you said, you learn to ask the question up front, all right, God, I see the storm, I see the clouds. What, what are you trying to get me to learn? You can't really head it off at the past because there's growth in the storm. Right. Yeah. But you know, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and sometimes he will direct you away from the storm. And sometimes he directs you right through it. Yeah. Brother Seth, can you <clears throat> can you read us that definition again? You earlier you were talking about the being reliant on the Lord. Can you just read that one more time for us, please? Uh, yes. Um, the meek are those wholly relying on God, rather than their own strength to defend against injustice. Mm. It's the opposite of self assertiveness and self interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not accompanied with self at all. You hit us with that pretty early on in this particular episode, and that has been like the, the baseline that has tied all yeah. of this together because every scripture we have read from has restated that. Mm -hmm over and even down to this one in Proverbs 3, over and over and over again, it is reliance on God and yeah. not on self. Yeah. Uh, just, just for bonus, uh, this is Psalms 84 and 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. Uh, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. The Lord of, this is 12, Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusteth in me. I think that kind of plays into like, you know, looking at self-application. Understanding that you don't know everything. That God's yeah. ways are above our ways. And especially, you know, let's take it to a new level. For those called to ministry, right? You all have this idea of what God's called you to do, whether it's uh, in the five, you know, what we'd call the five-fold ministry or uh, missionary overseas or planning a church event, whatever the case may, it may be. 
A lot of times we feel that we want something done a certain, I've had to learn this the hard way. Uh, (laughs) We want something done a certain way and God, if you don't do it, if it's not done this way, I don't, my life is ruined, right? And it's learning to trust God with what you hold dearest to your life. When you build your life from this foundation that, and you can make an idol of ministry, you know, make an idol of, of this. And it's understanding that, you know what, God, I give this to you. And if it doesn't turn out my way, it's not going to destroy who I am. Because ultimately, I know you have my best interest at heart. And ulti- ultimately, it's not about me furthering my kingdom. Right. Even if it, I'm labeling it your kingdom, right? right. It's truly about furthering yeah. your kingdom and allowing God to change mm. what you think should have happened yeah. in any situation yeah. in life. And I think, you know, the irony behind all that too, right, is all the while humanity is trying to build their kingdom, trying to conquer the world and, and be in the top of their game in their respective field or, or whatever the case may be, but reading this, blessed are the meek, for they shall what? Mm-hmm. Inherit the earth. Like the literal earth. Countries, regions, nations. You will inherit the earth. In, in Psalms, it tells us how um, when the Lord returns and bids us come with Him, that we will be rulers of worlds, plural. And when you do some midrash studies, um, that world, that word "worlds" actually means cosmos. You, you know, and so it's like we're, we're we're futilely working our hands to the bone in the flesh to try and get something that is so temporally almost useless because you build so much so much wealth and then you give it to your kids or your grandkids, and because they don't have that same mentality. It's gone. It's, mm. it's, it's spent. And then what? Then, then there's nothing left. But this is, if you remain meek, you're going to inherit the earth. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and we don't do it to inherit the earth. That's a plus one right there. That's, that's the bonus. Is, and not to mention that in the first episode, we talked about how uh, about midway through this chapter being salt losing its savor. This is a key aspect. This is, this is a key component of being a profitable, like you just said, a profitable Christian. Expanding the kingdom of God requires us to be meek. Mm-hmm. It requires us to have the ability to make judgments but reserve judgment. It requires us the ability to see the rain coming unless God says, hey, warn them, then I can't, I can't bail you out. This is a hard concept, but here's something to chew on. I might hurt you inadvertently unless I understand how you can be hurt. So that's kind of another way of looking at this as far as possessing the ability to inflict pain, like have a sword, know how to use it to keep the sheaves. There's almost like you... you, you come to understand or know what can inflict not just physical pain or wounding, but emotional or spiritual wounding. And when you understand that, or in other words, when you've mourned, when you've gone through some things, yeah. when you have lived through it, yeah. you are now sensitive in a way yeah. that you are very careful with people, yeah. that you don't want to... Yeah. inflict those things that you have experienced yeah. because you've lived it. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's like you it's almost like you have to understand what it is that can cause damage so that you know what not to do. Because that is mm. not reconciliation in people, right? Right. But then there's this inheritance of the earth. There is this incredible picture that we see with keeping things in their proper place. And as you said, uh, inherit the earth it takes me back to, again, keeping things in their proper place. Yeah. And if you will do so, it's not so that you can inherit the earth right. any more than we live a righteous life so that we can 
role in riches and treasures in heaven. That's not what it's about. Right. It's about the relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But the mansions and the treasures that are laid up for us there yes. is it's a bonus, but that's not why we do it. Yeah, the right. why behind it is the relationship with our Lord. Right. And that's the same thing that causes us. That's why we strive for meekness. You strive to put those things in their proper place so that you can maintain the relationship. Right. And an added bonus is everything else that God wants to yeah. add unto you. Yeah. Uh, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto yeah. you. There's, there's an abundance that God wants to heap on but you're not seeking that. You're seeking Him. Right. Well, it's... I'll say this and I'll say the other thing and then we'll, we'll be done. But, uh, <laughs> um, it's, <clears throat> it's Solomon, right? Ask anything and I'll give it to you. Well, give me, give me all of the wisdom of man. Well, because you didn't ask for all of the riches, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you the wisest man to ever live, but also I'm going to pour out my riches unto you. I think it's richer than that, though. Oh, when we had a chance to talk about wisdom, when you read 1 Kings 3, it said Solomon asked for an understanding heart, and it literally right. translates to hear, listen, and obey. Right. What do I see? And what do you see? Right. But meekness, right. keeping things in their proper place. Right. The reason he asked for that was because you've called me to lead this so great a people that can't even be numbered. How am I going to do that? And he said, I am a child. I don't know the way out or in. I have right. spiritual vertigo, Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't even know which way right. is up. But if you'll simply speak and instruct me and teach me, I'll do everything you tell me to, to the letter, mm -hmm. just tune my ear. Help me to stay humble. Help me to stay teachable. And I'll do everything you tell me right. to do. And under those circumstances, I am confident I can lead these people. Right. In other words, if I keep things in their proper place, I am confident that I can lead the, yep. the earth that you want me to inherit. Yep. I mm -hmm. can step into this authority that you're calling me to if you will, mm -hmm. if you'll stay primary, if you'll be the main mm -hmm. thing, right. keep the main thing the main thing. Keep things in their proper place, right. in their proper divine order. Right. Everything else yep. falls in line. Yep. That's exactly it's right. It's the meekness that, it, there was a meekness because he did. He, he, he humbled himself. He said, I'm a child. I don't know the way out or in. I need you to tell me what to do and I'll do it. That is the language that didn't translate well into English, but that's what he was praying to the Lord. And that's what pleased the Lord. He said, you know what? Because you've kept things in their proper place, mm -hmm. and because you've kept a meek spirit, I'm not only going to grant you wisdom, I'm going to grant you wealth, mm -hmm. riches, favor. I, yep. It's yours. Yep. <laughs> and Solomon didn't do that because he thought he would get riches. Right. Wasn't in his thought process, wasn't in his wheelhouse. What he knew was that his father wasn't allowed to build the temple because he was a man of war. Right. And looking back at, at last week's episode, I wonder if Sol Solomon didn't see that his father had stopped inquiring of the Lord mm -hmm. and said, you know, I'm going to do my best to not do that. So when you ask me, what do I want, Lord? I don't know. I don't know what I... And that's ultimately, I think, what he was saying was, I don't know. Mm. I just don't know. But if you can show me <laughs> what to know then that's what I want. But what is his leadership pattern? It's, that, it's the exact thing. It's, it's inquiring of the Lord. Yeah. Lord, left or right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's exactly Lord, what right. do we do? Yeah. Where do yeah. we go? Who do we speak to? Yeah. What do we build next? Yeah. What do we, what do we offer and sacrifice right. to you next? You just tell me and I'll make it happen. Yeah. And, and, look, and look at that, right? Is Solomon was able to discern the ability to have meekness because of his father's lack of inability to mourn correctly. Mm. My God. And so generationally, now what does that make us responsible for as fathers, number one, but number two as leaders? Yeah. 
But first off, as fathers, if we can't teach our children correctly how to be poor in spirit, and then this is the other thing I was talking about, is this is beginning to look a whole lot like a roadmap. Mm -hmm. If we can't first teach our children, both physical and spiritual, how to be poor in spirit, how to mourn healthily, and how to be meek, there's no way to inherit the earth. There's no way. There's, and, and honestly, Solomon, to this day, is still considered to have been, accounting for inflation, the wealthiest man to ever live. He had literally inherited the earth. You know my favorite thing about, uh, I can't not remember where it is. I'll find it, and we can share it maybe in the description. Um, the Bible says that silver was counted as stone in Solomon's day. In other words, he, he was so plentiful yeah. with riches. Yeah. Silver was like counted as nothing. So get that yeah. out of here. Yeah. Where's the gold? Where's the, where's where is the true riches? Right. I, that's insane to me. Yeah. That that silver in Solomon's kingdom was accounted as gravel. Yeah. <laughs> what? All because he did what? When he was asked, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what I want, Lord. I, I've got no ability to do anything that I know that you're calling me to do. And this is, this is the beauty of meekness, right? Is the fact that I know that I don't know, and I know that I can't produce it, and I'm not going to try. Mm. That roadmap is what must lead us as people mm -hmm. to Christ. Mm -hmm. What was it Socrates said? He said, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's something to be said there, um, even in our spiritual walk, is that as we grow, and if we're truly teachable, as the Lord reveals the riches of His wisdom, there is no wisdom or counsel against the Lord. Right. None. None. <laughs> None. In other words, there, there's depths of wisdom that have been untapped because wisdom was a pupil that was at his side before the earth was formed. That's a whole other lesson. But when he teaches us, and if we're really listening, I'm telling you, the more God reveals to you, the more you'll realize there's so much more to know about yeah. you that I haven't even tapped into. Right. I want to know you more. Yeah. I have to know him more. Oh, that I may know him. I feel those words in Scripture resonated so powerfully, and I feel like that's the spirit of meekness. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for the revelation, God. I thank you for the hearts and minds of my friends that I have been able to come into this space with, Lord, to rightly divine the word of God, that I could leave this place enriched, with the wisdom and the instruction and the counsel that your word has for us. Lord, thank you for all the riches that you have shown me, but don't let me leave this place, leaving any of this behind. God, I pray that my spirit and the spirit of any watching or listening, God, would be able to pick these things up. Lord, that they would be with them not only today, but in their tomorrow, in their next week, in their next year, and whatever time you give them on this earth, Lord. I pray that we would continue to remain teachable, to remain meek, oh God, that we could be your hands, your feet on this earth, because it's all about you, Lord. It's all about the kingdom advancing. I thank you, Lord, and we ask that the Lord of the harvest would raise up laborers, oh God, that they would be able to fight and pray and war in the spirit in whatever fashion you're calling them to. We ask these things in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. Thank you. Well, thank you, fellas, for another great conversation. Appreciate all of you. Always remember, guys, number one, we love you. And uh, we are all epistles written and read of all men. And we bless you in Jesus' name.